The next thing I'd like to look at is a specific type of tension, or a specific way of modeling tension of objects that stretch. So, so far we've been talking about tensions for things like cables, chains, ropes, where we're expecting not to have much stretch, or we'll assume that it's not stretching. Now we'll relax that consideration a little bit to objects that can stretch, and in fact that can compress and do some other things. So this applies to the force of tension, but it also is applicable for different kinds of forces as well, as we'll see. So first we look at the force from a spring. What we'll talk about is the force that the spring exerts on whatever it's in contact with. So what we know from our everyday experience is that when you stretch a spring, it pulls back. It resists your stretch. Also, if you try to compress a spring to make it shorter than its equilibrium length, it will push out again, again opposing the distortion from the equilibrium. We also know that the more distorted you make the spring, the harder it resists that distortion. So it's a restoring force. So it's a restoring force. It's an increasing restoring force. The farther it gets away from equilibrium, the more vigorously it tries to return to equilibrium. The simplest kind of force that follows this behavior was described by Robert Hooke. He was a contemporary of Isaac Newton, and he expressed it in Latin as utensio sic vis, as the pull, so the stretch. The force, F, which is the force exerted by the spring, is equal to minus kx. These quantities, the k, is known as the spring constant. This is not some fundamental constant of the universe. There is a specific k for each spring. So k is a characteristic of a spring, just like m mass is the characteristic of objects. Whenever you see it in a formula, it has to be a positive number. Its units are going to be newtons per meter. x is the distance which your spring is displaced from its equilibrium, the difference from its equilibrium length. So if you stretch it one centimeter beyond the equilibrium length, then x would be plus one centimeter. If you compress it one centimeter shorter than its equilibrium length, then x is minus one centimeter. The minus sign tells us that the force exerted by the spring opposes the distortion of the spring. So if you make the spring longer, x is positive, and the force will be negative in the opposite direction, trying to contract the spring and make it shorter again. If you compress the spring, make it shorter, x is negative, the force F will then be positive, trying to push the spring back to its equilibrium. It turns out that this Hooke's Law relationship applies not only to springs that experience tension, but to any kind of small distortion of a solid object. In fact, even to things like gas-filled pistons, this force is an extremely good approximation for what actually goes on. It works for any small distortion, be they linear springs, three-dimensional objects that can compress in three dimensions, also twisting forces, torsion, flexing, all of these can be modeled very nicely by Hooke's Law for small distortions. For larger distortions, there may be deviations from this linear proportion of force being directly proportional to the displacement. But for small displacements, it's a very good approximation, and it shows up in all sorts of applications.